It brings out all that is best. One on, two out, Reigns hits it to right. Back to back to back. And Williams gets into it, left center field. Without victory, there is no survival. After a Game 4 miracle, the Indians and the Yankees meet in a winner-take-all matchup in Game 5 from Cleveland. Yes, indeed, Cleveland rocks. Tonight, it's Game 5 in the AL Division Series between the Yankees and the Indians. New York sends Andy Pettit to the mound. He tries to redeem his Game 2 loss against the hero so far for the Indians, young 21-year-old fireballer Jared Wright, who tries to send the Tribe to the AL Championship Series in Baltimore. Welcome inside Jacobs Field, everybody, and our coverage of Major League Baseball on Fox. I'm Chip Carey, joined by Steve Cycle Lions and my friend who doesn't get any bigger or better than a Game 5 tonight. Well, you know, I never got to experience a Game <laughs> 5 when I was a player, so I'm happy to be sitting here as part of the Fox team. And I'm glad you're here as well, because that means it's psychoanalysis time, and there's no doubt about it. Jared Wright has been absolutely marvelous for this Cleveland Ball Club, Steve. Nobody expected much from this kid, but he went to New York, got the win, and tonight looks for his second win in the series. Well, 21 years old, obviously he's seen Bull Durham more than I have. <laughs> he has all the right cliches going. I got to have the ball in game five, and the pressure's all on the Yankees. You might say this guy's got a great set of guts. Yeah, that's what I said. And he proved it in game two after he settled down. He was able to use both sides of the plate. Look at this pitch comes way inside on Jeter. Next pitch, he comes right back with the same pitch to strike him out. Later in the ball game, Tino Martinez on a 1-2 pitch. If you make a mistake on that pitch right there, Tino will hit it into the seats. Then he goes back door with a breaking ball and on a 3-2 count, he says, you know what? Here's my country fastball. See if you can hit it, Tino. Tino came up empty. And we talked to Mike Cargrove, the Indian manager, about right. He said with a wry smile, expect the unexpected from this kid. They expect a big ball game from the 21-year-old tonight. Same story for the Yankees. Andy Pettit was not Andy Pettit in game two. He was knocked around badly by the Tribe. He's suffering from a bad back. The Indians or the uh, Yankees are downplaying the severity of Pettit's injury, but if he can't get the ball inside, the Indians will try to finish him off early. Well, Andy Pettit has to remember who the veteran is, who's the 18-game winner here. He's got to be able to pitch inside, and that's something that he got away from in game two. Look at this ball out over the plate to David Justice. Girardi setting up inside to Alomar. That ball bounced out over the plate. Same thing to Jim Tomey. Now let's slow it down for the at-bat to Tony Fernandez. Watch Joe Girardi slide inside because that's where he wants the pitch. He wants the ball in off of Fernandez's back knee right about there. But what he gets is the ball sailing about out over the plate, and this ball gets hammered. That's the ball that was hit over Curtis's head for the two-run double. And I'll tell you, what, a good sign for Andy Pettit would be if he hits somebody. Because if he does that, he's showing me that he's going to miss in and not out over the plate. Steve, let's talk about emotions. The Yankees clearly shell-shocked after last night's occurrence. And, of course, for the Indians, mighty momentum is on their side tonight. Well, I'll tell you what, if I looked at this game, this series coming in, I would have said the Yankees are the better team. Unfortunately, without Cone now and the fact that the, Yan the Indians came back, they're having a lot more fun than the Yankees right now. Well, the ballpark is rocking. We're going to send it upstairs now for the call of Game 5 between the Yankees and Indians. Joe Buck, Tim McCarver, and Bob Renly are standing by. All right, Chip and Steve, thank you very much as we get ready for Game 5, the deciding game of what really has been a terrific series between the Yankees and the Indians. One more note about the pitching, Bob Brenly, and a final note about Andy Pettit before this game begins. The Yankees obviously hoping for better results tonight than in Game 2. Well, Andy Pettit is hoping that his postseason history repeats itself. First time around against Baltimore and Atlanta last year in the postseason, the numbers are not very pretty. Second time around against Baltimore in the ALCS clinching game, he was very strong. Game 5 against Atlanta in the World Series shut him out for 8 and a third innings. 
You heard Psycho and Chip talking about that back injury. One thing to keep an eye on in the game tonight, if he has a high pitch count inning and then his offense has an extended inning, that's usually when that problem manifests itself. So we'll keep an eye on that tonight. Well, while we have to talk about pitching, everybody loves to talk about home runs in a postseason series. And Tim McCarver last night, two big home runs hit by the Cleveland Indians. Well, Joe Torre, you may remember, said that the New York Yankees cannot go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Cleveland Indians as far as power is concerned. The Indians with too many thumpers, but the Yankees did it in game one. Three consecutive home runs, they won. The Grand Slam home run by Paul O'Neill in game three, they won. But last night, the Indians regaining the toehold. Second inning, a 2-2 fastball inside to David Justice from Doc Gooden. A home run to right field, and did he ever hit it? That made it 2-1, bottom of the eighth, two outs, and nobody on. Off Mariano Rivera, Sandy Alomar, a home run that won the game. And of course, I know what you're thinking. It didn't win the game, it tied the game. But in my mind, it won the game because few teams could come back from something that emotional. And the Yankees did not last night. I know the three of us couldn't wait for the start of tonight's game right after last night's game. It was a lot of fun in game four. Who will grab that final spot for the 1997 LCS? We're all about to find out. First pitch after this from your local Fox station. The Cleveland Indians get ready to head to work in game five. Manager Mike Hargrove sends a 21 year old rookie right hander to the mound tonight. A couple of deep breaths and away we go. Here's the Miller Lite starting lineup for the New York Yankees. They lead it off with Tim Raines in left field. Derek Jeter batting second and short. He's had a very strong division series. Paul O'Neill is in right. Then Bernie Williams cleaning up has only one hit. Tino Martinez at first. The DH is Mike Stanley, his first start of the series. Charlie Hayes at third again. Joe Girardi is catching and again batting ninth at second base. It's Ray Sanchez. What about the defense for the Cleveland Indians as they take the field? Roberts, Grissom, and Ramirez in the outfield. Only two errors in this series, both by starting pitchers. So defensively, this has been a solid Indians crew. And tonight, a guy who got solid in a hurry after a rocky first inning in game two, 21-year-old Jared Wright. Well, they talked about his poise, and he exhibited it in game two, a rocky first inning, walked three consecutive batters was on the verge of getting pulled from the ball game and then was able to regroup compose himself and really pitch an outstanding ball game after the first the Yankees have to be saying all right all you fastball hitters here he is <laughs> because here he is outstanding power pitcher that two seamer goes inside to a right handed batter the four seamer when it's up it's more effective. He can't throw the change up for strikes, but look for him to establish the hard stuff, especially the first time through the lineup. He pitches inside, and young pitchers who pitch inside now are a rarity, believe me. He started this season at double-A Akron. His manager, Mike Hargrove, sends him out to work in game five, the deciding game to see who will move on to the ALCS to take on the Baltimore Orioles. We asked his manager, Mike Hargrove, what he expects out of Jarrett Wright. Uh, the one thing that I've, I've come to expect with a 21-year-old uh, talent is to expect the unexpected. And, and uh, J uh, Jared has been very good for us all year long um, <clears throat> in, in, in tough circumstances. And, and uh, the one thing about it is that he has the stuff to get himself out of, out of jam. Well, he proved that final point in game two of this series and difficult circumstances guys I would say this qualifies Tim Raines leads it off with Jeter and O'Neill to follow we remind you that this broadcast is also available in Spanish by utilizing the SAP button on your television glad you're with us game five who moves on to the ALCS we're all about to find out The home plate umpire tonight, the crew chief, Davey Phillips. Rocky Rowe at first, Tim McClellan at second, Dale Ford at third, Ken Kaiser down the left field foul line, and Greg Koss who worked the plate here last night down the right field line. 
97 miles per hour, one and one. And Alomar's throw back was 53. He's got good stuff tonight, too. <laughs> be a good sign for the Indians if Jarrett Wright is missing the strike zone low keeping the ball down a little problems overthrowing the ball in game one in the first inning to a lot of pitches up high out of the strike zone low again it's three and one I would imagine Reigns will be taking here. Full count. Some imagination. Three balls, two strikes on Reigns with Jeter and O'Neill to follow. The reason I said that was the other night, Jared Wright walking hitters number two, three, and four. No walk expected out of the Cleveland faithful here, however. Booing Tim Raines, how dare you delay this? As right. he steps out for this 3-2 pitch. I think this is something you'll see the Yankees do a lot tonight to try to unnerve the youngster out there. Kind of like a football team calling timeout on an important field goal. And I ace that kicker, but I don't know if it's going to bother Jared Wright too much. Jared Wright is the fourth youngest ever to start a decisive game in a postseason series. Behind Fernando Valenzuela, Brett Saberhagen, Don Gullett. He's 6'2", 230, with a ton of confidence. And here's Rain stepping out again. Well, you can see there are some gnats buzzing around the home plate area tonight, but. Once again, I think that this is what's something that the Yankees are going to try to do to unnerve Jarrett Wright, try to throw him out of his rhythm. Three consecutive foul balls after the count went full on Reigns. Joe, you mentioned the youthful Jarrett Wright. He is the second youngest pitcher to win a postseason game against the New York Yankees. The youngest, Ralph Branca, back in 1947. down the line and another foul ball great at bat by Tim Raines you have at bats like this and what you do you give the rest of the lineup a chance to see how hard Jarrett Wright is throwing one of the things that gets lost when a leadoff man even though he may make an out has a 10 pitch at bat Tenth pitch of this at bat coming here Into right center field, a base hit and a good start for Reigns and the Yankees. Reigns will not test Ramirez, but a leadoff single. And on that 10 pitch at bat, Reigns is on to start the game for New York. Well, the more you see that fastball, the better gauge you have on it. Tim Reigns with some defensive swings just to foul it off, but he gets one up over the heart of the plate. After seeing nine pitches, you can be pretty sure you're going to be on the tenth if it's in the strike zone. The Yankees got two in the first inning last night. Final out at the top of the first inning came when Brian Giles, a left fielder, gunned down Tino Martinez at the plate. Jeter showing bunt and taking ball one. Derek Jeter will do that sometimes in the first inning, first time up to draw the infield in. Matt Williams drawing drawn in then this of course would be a bunt for a base hit this early in the ball game Rain 
Reigns is going. Alomar's throw. Not in time, and the stolen base for Tim Reigns is his first of this postseason series. Usually with a young power pitcher, Bob mentioned earlier that he, to be successful, he has to throw up in the strike zone. This ball appeared to be down. A tough pitch for Alomar to handle. A good jump by Reigns. Put those together, you've got a stolen base. And a very deliberate, deliberate delivery to second base by Sandy Alomar. I think he realized he didn't have much of a chance to catch him and didn't want to rush his throw, but he one hopped it into second base anyway. Now Jeter trying to go to right to advance the runner, fouls it for strike two. And here he is, two strikes, and a guy who really is not just good at going to right, but is as good a hitter as you will find in this situation to hit the ball to the right side of the field. It's funny about Derek Jeter. He is a natural right field hitter with two strikes on him. He can inside out the ball on inside fastballs as good as anybody in the American League. Two and two. Talk about a guy who thinks at the plate. He knows when to be offensive when the count's in his favor and when to be defensive when the count's in the pitcher's favor. And him reaching one away. the fake bunt on the first pitch from J.R. Wright was way inside the two seam fastball then the stolen base now the pitch off trying to go the other way Wright misses way outside comes back with a great slider good pitch to throw when the batter's trying to go the opposite way that was the first breaking ball that Jared Wright has thrown in his 15 pitches you throw an off speed pitch to a hitter who's trying to hit the ball the opposite way more often than not they'll get out in front roll over the top and pull that ball to the left side that time Jeter couldn't come up with it at all. So range still at second with one out as Jarrett Wright focuses in on Paul O'Neill. Well, we've talked about it during this divisional series how Paul O'Neill likes to hit the ball the opposite way. And we've also mentioned the fact that O'Neill is a guy who could probably be a 30 home run hitter, maybe even more, playing in Yankee Stadium if he chose to be. Hold the ball a little bit more, but he's so effective using the entire field, forces the defense to play him on us. One and one. The numbers for O'Neill this season, the best in the American League with runners in scoring position. In this postseason, three out of five, and last night. In the first inning, an RBI double down the left field line. It's for Jeter who had doubled. The opposite way and fouled out of play for strike two. One of the great early weapons for Jarrett Wright may be any breaking ball that he throws for a strike. It really doesn't have to be the good breaking ball because all Yankee hitters are so dead set in trying to hit that fastball that any breaking ball that wasn't really a good quality slider to Paul O'Neill but he couldn't catch up to it set up at one and two You think back to any of the great power pitchers throughout the history of baseball. Nolan Ryan, you talk to hitters, if he's got his curveball, he's going to be nasty. Doc Gooden, early in his career, if he's got his curveball over the plate, he's going to be nasty. Jarrett Wright's the same way, and I agree, it doesn't have to be a perfect breaking ball. Just being able to get that breaking ball over the plate makes that fastball look that much quicker. What Paul O'Neill is set up for right now is that slider down and in, out of the strike zone. To the right side, and a pitch down and in, and the put out 3-1 over to third is range, two out. The O'Neill geared for that fastball, and with two strikes, you're a defensive hitter, so you're more inclined to chase the bad breaking ball down. Look at Alomar's target, down. The pitch, down. O'Neill reaches and makes an out.
So after the leadoff hit by Reigns, he stole second, but Jeter struck out, did not advance the runner. A big out as he struck out, and then O'Neill grounds out. Here's Bernie Williams, only one hit in this series, but it did come against Jarrett Wright in game two. guy in Bernie Williams who the Yankees have relied on in their past two divisional series in 95 against Seattle last year against Texas five division series home runs and an average of 444 runner at third two out and now three and all on Bernie Williams hey, Joe Torrey said he feels the problem with Bernie Williams right now is he just swinging too hard really trying to do too much at the plate really trying to drive the ball when you try to do anything above what you're capable of doing suddenly things start going wrong mechanically and you really find yourself struggling a two out walk first walk of the night for Jared Wright puts runners at the corners here in the first inning with Tino Martinez coming up now this sounds strange there are some walks that are good if, for instance, Jarrett Wright walks the red-hot Paul O'Neill to get to Bernie Williams, who, with only one hit, that would be considered a good walk. Walking Bernie Williams with only one hit to get to Tino Martinez is not a good walk, nor a good idea. Tino, unlike last season, four out of 14 in this division playoff, with the Indians looking for a two-out hit, taking ball one. Last year struggled in the postseason to the point that in the World Series, Cecil Fielder got a lot of the playing time. At first base in place of Martinez. Tino only one for 11 against the Atlanta Braves in the World Series last year. First and third, two out. One and one on Martinez. The standard book on any hitter up and in low and away those are the only two cold spots in Tino Martinez stroke and the two areas circled right there are where you have to be very careful ball out over the plate and up that was out over the plate and up but it was 98 miles an hour gas Woo. That was in that hot zone. <laughs> a little bit too hot. Yeah, it was, it was Wright's hot zone, too. <laughs> Another Yankee hitter calling timeout as Jarrett Wright was ready to deliver the pitch, and he didn't even fake like there were bugs in his eyes. To the second baseman Fernandez and a much better start in game five than in game two for Jared Wright bottom of the first inning Indians bat no score that's how Jared Wright exited the field after the top of the first inning now it's Andy Pettit's turn and a look at the Miller Light starting lineup for the Cleveland Indians they lead it off with Pip Robertson left Omar Vizquel is batting second with Manny Ramirez in right. Matt Williams cleans up. David Justice, the DH. Sandy Alomar Jr., the hero here last night, one of many for the Indians, is batting in that sixth spot with Tommy, Fernandez, and Grissom rounding out the Cleveland lineup. And a look at the Yankees defensively. Up the middle, Jeter and Sanchez. No errors so far in this division series with Cleveland. And on the mound tonight, the loser from game two, left-hander Andy Pettit. Andy Pettit's numbers on the season. I guess it bears repeating his best pitch is bread and butter is that cut fastball. He's very stubborn about it too. He continues to go to it 
even on nights when he doesn't have a good one and it's a pitch that has very little margin for error. Missing inside to Bip Roberts with ball one. Starts Bip Roberts right out with it. Cutter on, had missed inside. Lasted only five innings in game two. And allowed nine hits. 2-0. Oh. Second pitch down and in four strike two two and two on Roberts now that was a slider right there it's distinguished between the cutter the cutter looks more like a fastball the slider looks more like a breaking ball From two and out to two and two another difference between those two pitches for Pettit he usually tries to throw the cut fastball up in the strike zone from the belt up run it in on the hitters hands the slider will normally be down below the belt breaking down towards the hitter's shoes. Off the plate, Tino fights the lights and did not get it to first in time. Bip Rob Roberts going in head first, did his left hand beat the bag before the underhand throw by Martinez got to Pettit. Looked like it. Looked like a good call by Rocky Rowe. Tino almost lost that ground ball in the lights. Ball hit right off the home plate. Bouncing off a trampoline, he's looking straight up as if he were catching a pop-up, a very low toss. Normally not a good idea to slide into first base unless you're avoiding a tag, but hard to penalize hustle. I just don't like to see guys do that. So easy to injure fingers, wrists, arms, get your hands stepped on. But Dick Roberts showing great hustle getting down that line. Well, just like the top half of the first inning started, a base hit by the leadoff man. Reigns would then steal second, but was stranded. Jarrett Wright got around that hit and stolen base. And like we talked about in game two, here's that game within the game between Pettit on the mound and whoever is running the bases at first. There is no better pickoff move in the game today than that of Andy Pettit. Wiskell takes ball one. As an offensive ball club against Andy Pettit, you almost get yourself into a position where you have to guess. Go on first move. I think if Roberts runs, it will probably be part of a hit and run. Perfect bunt by this count. And the sacrifice is good 1-4. Down to second, Roberts with one out. Mike Hargrove telling us that Omar Vizquel, the best bunter on the Indians, and he proves it right here. the Indians asked for something out of Manny Ramirez. They bunt Roberts down to second. With one of their hottest hitters and now put it on the shoulders of Manny Ramirez who is two out of 17 in this series. That's one of the byproducts of that great pickoff move. It forces the opposition to give up outs to advance runners in the scoring position when you normally would be able to steal a base.
We see that cut fastball again, and as Steve Lyons said in the pregame show, it's important that he gets it in there. In game two, he was leaving that pitch out over the plate, allowing the Indians to get some good hacks at him. When he's missed tonight, he's missed further inside. Second baseman Sanchez over to third Roberts two out. There are two guys, one on the Indians, one on the Yankees, that both teams are trying to get going. Manny Ramirez for the Indians, and we talked about Bernie Williams. Both players and both hitters are vital to the offense of both teams. That'll bring in Matt Williams. Looking for the two out RBI hit. Three out of 14 in the series and has Roberts over at third, two down. No score, first inning. A ball from Andy Pettit. Matt Williams delivered what was, in essence, the knockout blow to Andy Pettit in game two. This home run on a big breaking ball. The first pitch that Williams saw in the fifth inning. Two run shot. At the time, it was the first home run allowed by Andy Pettit since August 1st. Roberts at third, two down, and a check on Charlie Hayes. Deals with a nasty hop, makes the play to end the inning. One of the reasons why Charlie Hayes is in the lineup. Andy Pettit appreciates the effort. Bad hop, out number three, and after one in game five, no score. Jaron Wright goes back to work in the top of the second. No score. The Yankees stranded a couple in their half of the first inning. Indians left one. Here's Mike Stanley. First start of this series, and he takes a ball high from Jared Wright. Talk about a subtle display of confidence in young Jared Wright by Mike Hargrove when you sacrifice in the first inning with the guys having the best series on either team. Fernandez can't handle the short hop, and Stanley is on to start the second. This was not an in-between hop and a ball that Tony Fernandez usually sucks up. It is being scored a base hit, but normally Tony sucks that ball up. Ball hit the webbing and just stayed there. Had he made the play, he throws Stanley out easily. Stand the leadoff man is on for New York for the second inning in a row, and here's Charlie Hayes. Three out of 11 in this series. Well, there's such a subtle difference for an infielder when that ball hits the dirt as opposed to hitting that outfield grass, especially tonight. There's a little bit of dew on the grass out there on the field. It appeared that ball hit the outfield grass first and really skipped on Tony Fernandez. Hard hit through the hole into left field. Back to back hits. Stanley goes station to station. It's two on, nobody out here in the second. Jared Wright got that ball down in the strike zone, down inside part of the plate. Charlie Hayes hammers it to left field. That ball, a low tracer into left. Down and in. Charlie Hayes ever so slightly clearing those hips stepping in the bucket just a little bit with that left foot. Make sure he gets those hips out of the way on that fastball and really drill it in the left field. You got to cheat somehow on that fastball is coming in 98 miles an hour. Now with runners at first and second nobody out here is Girardi the number eight hitter. Frank one to Joe it's going to take if the Yankees keep the bunt play on a good bunt. They get Stanley over to third. Well, you might not see three sacrifice bunt attempts in an American League game all year long. Shows you the kind of pressure and tension in this ball game tonight. Both managers trying to get on the board first. One and one. Say what Joe Torrey will do occasionally. He'll send the runners in this situation. Girardi, a good bat handler. And by putting that rotation play on, what the Indians do, they clear the middle of the field. If he could trickle the ball in the middle, he could find a hole. There 
go Stanley off the glove of right. And the only play is they try and they get the double play. Score it one, four, six, three, and a runner at third, two out here in the second. The problem with that play is one guy, one guy got the hit and run sign, Mike Stanley, and Charlie Hayes didn't. Mike Stanley is running. Charlie Hayes isn't running. The ball off the glove of Jared Wright, and look at Biscale. You talk about acrobatic. Oh, wow. Not only does he get up and avoid the sliding runner, but while he's in midair, he gets his body in a position to come down and be ready to throw. Lands on that right foot, takes a stride to first. What a play. Might remind you that had Wright come up with the ball, it's a triple play. He throws to first first, and then to second, Stanley's dead. Now Stanley's at third with two out and a strength to Sanchez. I don't know of any other shortstop other than Vizquel, who after popping up in the air to avoid the slide, coming down, still makes the throw to first and still gets the out to complete the double play. That's only one, amazing. The one guy who could do that, and he's retired, Ozzie Smith. Here it is right here. Charlie Hayes running late on the play. Mike Stanley off with the pitch. Hayes trying to do his job. Girardi is doubled up. Here's a little flare to center. Grissom says he has it. Inning over. The Yankees put their first two on. A double play ball off the bat of Girardi. Right through two scoreless innings. Seven American League Division Series on Fox is brought to you by Miller Lite, who reminds you that anything can happen at Miller Time. By Isuzu, builders of the completely reinvented 1998 Isuzu Rodeo. Isuzu, go farther. By IBM, solutions for a small planet. And by Visa, it's everywhere you want to be. Welcome back to Cleveland, Ohio. As we move to the bottom of the second, Yankees and Indians game five, no score. With Justice, Alomar, and Tomy coming up. Justice, who led off the second inning last night, and Homer deep into the seats in right. Behind on the count on one. going here Pettit seems to have a lot more zip on that cut fastball than he did in game two Game two, there were times it looked like a batting practice fastball as it came up to home plate very little movement very little velocity different story tonight over the outside corner two and two That's what you talked about early with Pennant, that margin for error. You're giving up a little velocity for that break action, that cut. And if it doesn't cut, it's like a batting practice fastball. And the location where you throw that pitch. Andy Pennant on three days rest has not really responded well. Three times this season, no decision when he worked on three days rest. Of course, not a lot of options this time of year. <laughs> but as you were talking about that cut fastball, you pick a target where you want to throw the ball, anticipating where it's going to end up. If you cut it too much or you cut it not enough, that pitch ends out, out over the plate and you get in big trouble. Two and two on Justice leading off. Going to be tough for Jeter. To his left. Good play, one out. That second high hop allowed Derek Jeter to get over in front of that ball. Had the ball stayed down, a much more difficult play. Andy Pettit, six feet four. Must be a high chopper to get it over his head. Good play by Jeter. Yeah, you're right with that high hop. It gives the infielder a chance to get his body into position. He can move right into the throw, continue with his throw hop, and go right to the target, as opposed to going down and getting that low hop. 
is Sandy Alomar. In this series, five out of 16, over 300, two home runs. Ball and a strike. Last night, facing Mariano Rivera. Couple out, down by a run. And after that swing, it was a 2-2 game in the eighth. Alomar with that home run, becoming the only big leaguer to hit a home run in the All-Star game and in a postseason game in the same season in the same ballpark. Oral Hershiser with his efforts here last night giving his team a chance to extend this series to five games. What a year for Sandy Alomar career highs and batting average home runs RBIs doubles. 30 game hitting streak all star game most valuable player 125 games played that's the biggest difference another one off the plate Sanchez another good play two gone here in the second something that you don't think about Andy Pettit much. Uh, as, as a guy who throws the ball down in the strike zone where hitters pound the top half of the ball making the ball go up good play by Sanchez the Indians have not got the ball out of the infield yet yeah, it's pretty apparent the Indians strategy against Pettit is to try to bang the ball off home plate as many times as you can <laughs> <laughs> two out nobody on for Tommy as he looks at ball one. Only three hits for Tommy in this series. He hit 40 home runs during the regular season. 2 0. Oh. 3 0 to Tommy. They'll cut him loose on three and oh two yeah. out nobody on. Yeah, I do. absolutely. Thing about Tommy, he's got power the other way too. If the fastball is away, he can just as easily hit the ball out and left. Tommy number two in the American League home run ratio and bats per home run. Second only to Griffey. Now Mike Hargrove wants to get Jim Tomei going. Best way to do it is turn him loose on a three and oh pitch. This is a pitch that Pettit is likely to take a little off of and try to get it in the zone. Down and in, three and one. Taste a bad pitch right there. Show me an unusual left-handed hitter, a better high ball hitter than low ball hitter, goes after this pitch off the plate, down and inside. On a three and zero, oh, when you get the hit sign, you have to think one pitch, one location. Into left field, right at Tim Raines. And a perfect second inning for Andy Pettit. Back in Cleveland for the third inning. After this, from your local Fox station. Yankees and Indians in game five, the deciding game in this divisional series. Through two scoreless innings. Third inning, top of the lineup for New York. Raines, Jeter, and O'Neill. Rain singled, stole a base in the first inning and takes a ball. That ball Girardi hit back through the middle on the hit and run. Hit very, very well. Charlie Hayes did not run immediately. Mike Stanley did. The hit and run was on, but Hayes didn't get it. Right at Fernandez in range is one for two. On the failed hit and run, watch Mike Stanley as Charlie Hayes is on at first. Mike Stanley's on at second. Stanley takes off with a count 0 and 1 to Girardi. So Stanley takes off. Hayes is still standing at first base. The reason that's an important play, the ball hit off the glove of the pitcher. 
And Vizquel can't make that type of play had Hayes been on top of him. And had he run right away, he would have been on top of him. So one guy got the hit and run, the other guy didn't. A very important play for the Yankees. There's Jeter with one out, nobody on, and what was a promising inning for the Yankees in the second. That one, four, six, three double play and a fly ball later. And the Yankees left one. They've stranded three for the first two innings against Jared Wright. Two and up. Yeah, we noticed in Jarrett Wright's last start and again on a couple of pitches here in this inning he has a tendency sometimes not to finish his pitches he ends up standing very erect on the mound the backside of his body won't follow through on the pitch you see his back foot or his right foot is behind his left foot normally they end up at least square and many times that right foot will swing around in front of the left foot but Wright finishes with his right foot close to the rubber sometimes finish the delivery. 3 and 0 on Jeter. Right with the somewhat of a short arm delivery. Most pitchers have a very long stroke with that arm in the back. You can see he keeps his arm bent throughout the delivery. As Cal takes care of Jeter, two out here in the third inning. After that one that bounced in from Jared Wright, Sandy Alomar went out to talk to the young pitcher. Sandy has to work a little harder with a rookie on the mound tonight. Well, I just got to uh, keep him confidence. I have to uh, take more uh, responsibility tonight than I did last night because I have to uh, guide his, uh, his kid to the game. Uh, I did it in New York, and uh, he followed you know, he followed it pretty well. So hopefully uh, he can do it today. But the main thing is that you, you have, we have to start throwing strikes. If we throw strikes, uh, I think we'll be in good shape. And with that strike zone, Jarrett Wright does not have to be too fine. We talked about it the first time Wright pitched, and what he pitches to. For the most part, he pitches to the chest protector of Sandy Alomar. That gives him a bigger, bigger target in the strike zone not to the mid one and one on O'Neill this gives you a bigger strike zone when you work to the four corners right there instead of just working to the catcher's mid the four corners still in the strike zone and with a guy with that kind of movement you just want to strike any kind that's strike two on O'Neill. You know, with some pitchers, you can almost figure out what they're going to try to do by what they do on the pitch before. They try to set up the following pitch with what they do with the pitch to the batter. But with a young pitcher like Jarrett Wright, with the live arm, live arm that he has, like you said to me, he's just aiming at the center of the strike zone most of the time and letting it go. If it goes down and in, it's by accident. If it tails away, it's by accident. Right. Two, two to O'Neill. Down and away. That accident makes it three and two. <laughs> you know, veteran pitchers will tell you the, the, the thing they hate the most is to face a young hitter who's up there hacking because you can't set them up. They're just looking for a ball to swing at. See it, hit it, get it, throw it. The 3 2. 
The Yankees have put at least a man on in every inning. Wright has yet to go one two three in any frame and the two out hit keeps the inning alive for Bernie Williams. Paul O'Neill the one Yankee hitter that seems to consistently be able to get the head of the bat on the ball no matter who's out there on the mound no matter what the count is to Paul O'Neill he manages to get the head on the ball when you throw it in the strike zone. In steps Bernie Williams walked his first time only one out of 13 in this series that's foul you mentioned the head of the bat the reason that Paul O'Neill put the head of the bat on the ball watch the head on his shoulders right there head on the shoulders was down you hit a lot of balls on the head of the bat when you do that picture perfect swing by O'Neill. guys relate something that Joe Torre said last night before the game about Paul O'Neill being one of the few who can look for the breaking ball and adjust to the fastball against a guy like Jared Wright. Can he still do that? He throws as hard as Jared Wright throws. I think you look for all hard stuff against Jared Wright and thereby you don't have to look for any breaking ball because the breaking ball is almost as hard as the fastball. Strike two on Williams. Now that breaking ball was clocked at 81 miles an hour in the game he pitched earlier in the series. His breaking ball was clocked at 87, 88 miles an hour, which is average fastball speed. Great location for this slider, outside corner. They've made Bernie Williams so inside conscious in this series that you can really work that outside corner against him. Two. You could see Bernie slapping the head of the bat. Usually when a hitter does that, he's trying to hold himself back. Watch him take this pitch and then defiantly slap the bat. He's trying to stay back, but he's lunging at the ball. The two main things about hitting is to have quick hands and to wait. The one bad thing that you can do probably the worst thing is to lunge at the ball. That's what Bernie Williams has been doing throughout this series. is a very good fastball hitter Jarrett Wright the youngster goes after him with sliders the first one fouled off stands him up with a fastball a backdoor breaking ball on that pitch you remember Tim told you that Bernie Williams was upset with himself because he didn't keep his hands back but on the last pitch he does the same thing commits yep. early with the hands swings right over the top of a breaking ball Tony Fernandez the number eight hitter leads it off Pettit he knows how to field his position good play one out Something you talked about in game two about Andy Pettit. Another weapon for the young left-hander. Tonight's overhead shots are courtesy of the Goodyear Blimp Stars and Stripes based in Pompano Beach, Florida. At the controls is Captain Jim Maloney from Vienna, Virginia. And of course, we thank Goodyear Blimp for all of their beautiful shots. They've had some nice weather to work with here in Cleveland over the past couple of nights. They certainly help brighten our production here with Fox. Here's Marquise Grissom, the number nine hitter. Got the leadoff hit in the ninth inning last night and scored the winning run. Really gives Mike Hargrove another leadoff hitter at the bottom of the order, even though there's one out in the inning right now with Marquise Grissom's speed. Pip Roberts and Omar Vizquel following him in the lineup. It really gives Mike Hargrove a lot of options if Marquise Grissom can reach base. Like that. Second hit for the Indians. It belongs to Grissom. Ball well, gets in on Marquise just a little bit, but he's a strong man. He's able to fight it off and muscle it out into left field. That appeared to be one of those cut fastballs that just didn't get in there far enough. Pettit's been doing a good job of it in the first couple innings of the ball game. 
Drop that one out over the plate. Grissom on trying to figure out Andy Pettit. He was picked off by Pettit in game two. Roberts strike one. Roberts singled, was bunted down to second back in the first, but stranded after ground ball outs hit by Ramirez and Williams. One on, one out. Strike two. Manager Joe Torre of the Yankees on Andy Pettit's pickoff move. Andy Pettit really neutralizes a lot of distractions that go on uh, when against you because he gets men on first base and they're very leery. They've heard about him. If they haven't heard about him, they see for themselves that he has uh, a power pickoff. I mean, he can get you even if you're looking right at him. That really accomplishes a lot defensively. Grissom still at first base. Potential for a ground ball double play right here. Andy Pettit leads the majors in double play grounders this year with 36. Roberts set up at 0 2. Into center field for a hit. Grissom slips at second, but able to get back two on one up. And Bob, your point in game two that base runners are so tentative at first base that most guys who would normally go to third on base hits stop at second. And that's exactly what happened when Marquise Grissom took the turn but opted to come back. He couldn't get a jump at first. Well, so many times the runner's leaning back to first base when the ball is put into play. You see, Grissom wanted to go to third. Nor Marquise Grissom normally would go to third on a soft fly ball right. center field like that, but had to hit the brakes, stay at second base. And now with two on one out it brings in Omar Vizquel eight out of 15 in this series. We also should say that all bets are off now when a when a runner gets on second because now you don't have the first baseman holding the runner on. So the chance of a double steal much greater than the chance of Grissom stealing and that's exactly what Jeter is doing. Trying to alert Ray Sanchez to hold the lead runner close. What that does it could open up a hole on the right side. Two on, one out for Vizquel. Vizquel dropped down a sacrifice bunt back in the first inning, just showing bunt on the first pitch here in the third. Yeah, no sacrifice intended there. You're not going to sacrifice two guys over with two outs, ultimately. Two on, one out here, and Sanchez gets in behind the runner. Well, Pettit does not bring it home. Well, as good as Pettit's move is to first base, he's very slow in unwinding and spinning around to throw to second base. Grissom should be able to take liberties with his lead out there unless Sanchez continues to jockey him. Jumped in on Vizquel in a hurry, and Omar did not get much of a cut. 0 and 2. Didn't want to, but did. <laughs> and with two on, one out, Andy Pettit has Vizquel set up at no balls, two strikes. Called at home plate as Sanchez again got in behind Grissom. See, the reason it's Sanchez's responsibility 
is Derek Jeter on the left side has got to respect Omar Vizquel's ability to pull the ball. That's why it's up to the second baseman now to hold the runner close. Time called before the pitch. Granted by the home plate umpire Dave Phillips. One of the funny things about baseball is that speed slows down the game. The Indians have plenty of it on base with Grissom the lead runner at second and Roberts on at first. No score third inning. 0 and 2 on Vizquel. And Andy Pettit goes right back out there again. He got Vizquel to check swing on a pitch up out over the plate out of the strike zone. He goes right back to that same location again. Tries to hold. This time the ball gets a piece of the bat. You can see the fake break by Marquise Grissom at second base. And what that does, it puts a lot of pressure on the trail runner. Because the trail runner a lot of times will take the bait and go two or three steps. You see Grissom going. I mean, Bip Roberts had to follow suit. Sometimes he gets hung up because he's too far out. Now the one two to his kill. To the right side, Martinez to second, out, no other play, nobody at first, and it's first and third, two out. The Yankees were very, very lucky then. Sanchez comes over to cover second base, Pettit came home, that opened up the whole right side of the infield. Fortunately for the Yankees, the ball was hit to Martinez because there was nobody in the vacated second base position. Here it is right here. Pettit throwing. Look at Sanchez. He's over near second base. Big hole on the right side. Fortunately, Martinez plugged it. Also, Andy Pettit found himself a spectator in the middle of the infield. Right. There. Any ball hit to the right side, it's the pitcher's responsibility to get over to first base. I don't think they would have been able to turn the double play, but at least there would have been somebody there in case the runner fell down running to first base. Right. Pettit caught himself watching the ball game that time. Now with first and third, two out. Struggling Manny Ramirez digs in. 0 for 1 tonight, two out of 18 in this series with only one RBI. His count on the move as Ramirez fouls away strike one. Huge jump then. Mike Hargrove telling us before game two that the Cleveland Indians had something off of Andy Pettit. He wouldn't tell us what, of course. We assume that it's something in the hands. We asked Mike again tonight, do you still have that edge against Pettit? He said, nope, he's changed. Now Mel Stottlemyre will come out to talk. I think what they want to do here is talk to Joe Girardi more than to Pettit. In case Fiskell goes, what are you going to do with the ball? I don't think they'll throw through. There are two outs. Ramirez is the batter. Ramirez has been struggling. I think if he does run, they won't throw through. We'll see. Well, there's several options for a catcher. They could throw through to second base. They could have a cut play at second base where one of the middle infielders will step in front of the bag, cut the ball off, relay it back to home. They could throw directly to third base, try to pick off Marquise Grissom. They could fake a throw and hopefully get Grissom coming down the line. A lot of different possibilities. Manny Ramirez trying to bust out of this slump. Career 400 plus hitter against Pettit. Grissom the lead runner at third. Is Kell over at first with two out. No score, third inning. Grissom is telling Marquise, or Vizquel telling Marquise Grissom to get off farther. Grissom expanding his hands like an accordion, telling Grissom, get off farther in case I run and he throws through. 
you can scamper home and some teams have a designated play where the runner at first base will intentionally take too big of a lead and get picked off and the runner at third base will anticipate that cheat down the line and try to steal home. for strike two. Saw Vizquel running on the first pitch, and if you're going to do it, now's a good time to do it. The run again. 0-2, two, two outs, struggling hitter at the plate. Possibly try to steal a run. First and third, two out. And there's Viz and They will just let him walk down to second base. Bob, that was a... He didn't do exactly what you said, but that's exactly what they were thinking. They actually wanted the throw from Pettit to first base. Watch Viz He even slows down when he gets towards second. He wants to get in a rundown. Pettit didn't bite. A lot of pitchers will balk in this situation as well. They look up and see that runner. They'll do something. They'll jump. They'll move the front leg first. Any way to get a run home. Try to steal a run. Now second and third. Two out. And to center. Williams back over his head. And the Indians take a 2 nothing lead. Scale went to second, uncontested, and now scores the second run on this huge hit by Manny Ramirez over the head of Bernie Williams. Bernie did not get a good jump on that ball. Had he gotten a good jump, I don't know whether he catches it or not. 2-0 Cleveland in the third. Now Ramirez at second, two out for Matt Williams. And talking to Matt Williams during batting practice today about the at bat against Andy Pettit when he hit the home run. He said that curveball from Andy Pettit was the only pitch Pettit threw him on the outside part of the plate the entire night. Everything else was inside, inside, inside. We talked about Charlie Hayes cheating for the fastball from Jarrett Wright. Look for Matt Williams to cheat for a pitch inside. was inside fouled away for strike two all three pitches that tonight have been inside on Matt Williams real good low ball hitter middle zone in right there is the best hot spot for Matt Williams the book on him is to try to get him to chase breaking balls out of the zone not as easy for Andy Pettit to do being a left handed pitcher. Probably thinking not that far inside off the instep of his left foot. Look at Girardi. It's right off the heel or the instep of the left foot of Matt Williams. Matt Williams broke his right foot a couple of years ago fouling an inside pitch off his back leg, which is very unusual. You rarely see a hitter do that. Very common to foul it off that front leg, especially those big power hitters. Oh, two to Williams.
it 3 nothing Cleveland. of what he did with the fastball outside. He misses with the fastball. Looked like he was trying to run the cutter in. It stays over the plate, and Williams trickles one through. Manny Ramirez with a key hit in the inning. The two-out, two-run double. He scores on a hit by Williams. Now Matt at first with two out for David Justice. First extra base hit of the series for Manny Ramirez. And was it ever a big one? You know, guys, while the media, and I include us in this, tries to make it seem like Jared Wright just figured out how to tie his shoes at the age of 21, very young. Andy Pettit's only 25 years yeah. old. Yeah. And it's interesting to see how he responds here tonight in the decisive game five and again on only three days rest. Williams running and Justice smokes one right at Ray Sanchez to end the inning. The Indians break through. Three runs, four hits. None bigger than that by Manny Ramirez. After three, Indians by three. For our Miller Lite series summary, game one went to the Yankees, the back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back home runs in that five-run sixth inning. The Indians win seven to five in game two behind Jarrett Wright on the mound tonight. The Yankees behind a complete game by David Wells win six one in game three. And then last night, the Indians come back. Alomar's homer in the eighth inning tied it. They won it in the ninth inning on a hit by Omar Vizquel. Jarrett Wright back to work. Tino Martinez leads it off. Stanley and Hayes will follow for New York. 3-0 Cleveland. One and one. In the three innings, Sandy Alomar Jr. receiving the warm-up pitches from Jarrett Wright a couple of different times. Stood up out of his crouch, held both palms up to Jarrett Wright, said, hey, settle down, relax, take your time. Don't get in too big of a rush now. up with a couple on back in the first. Up on the count here, two and one, now two and two. This crowd wants strikeout number three from Jared Wright. Three and two. Strikeout for Jared Wright as he gets Tino Martinez to start the fourth. Gasoline alley for Jared Wright. Breaking ball is high. Fastball, he couldn't catch up with it. Another high breaking ball. I think it's pretty clear that Tino Martinez cannot catch up to the Jared Wright fastball in that at bat. He is throwing awfully hard this evening. One out, nobody on, and now Stanley looks at ball one.
you can see the follow through on that swing by Tino Martinez come back and click Sandy Alomar on the mask. Now Stanley into center field for a one out base hit. One on one out for the Yankees here in the fourth inning. We remind you that Wednesday it's game one of the American League Championship Series when one of these two teams will head to Baltimore where they'll clash against the AL Eastern Division champion Orioles. Coverage begins live at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific, here on Fox on Wednesday night. Charlie Hayes singled his first time up. Strike one. Jared Wright, a linebacker in high school, says that uh, he probably would not have gone to a big college to play football, someplace like Pepperdine in Los Angeles. But he's got that linebacker mentality as a pitcher. He's built like a linebacker. Yeah, we talked about Mariano Rivera last night and how it's hard to see how a slender man like Mariano Rivera could generate that kind of power on his fastball. It's not hard to figure out how Jared Wright <laughs> can generate power on his fastball. That's right. You know, a slider is one of the more descriptive pitches in baseball because that's exactly what it does. It slides. It breaks parallel to the ground. Fine location from Jarrett Wright. Looked like Sandy Alomar thought it was a third out. Took a couple steps toward the dugout and said, uh-uh, three this inning. Here's Girardi. He takes a strike. Only two hits for Joe. Bounced into that one four six three double play back in the second. Stanley at first with two out for New York. Foul for strike two. Well, Joe Girardi's taken some very funny swings at sliders on the outside part of the plate throughout this series. Jarrett Wright starts him with two sliders. Could go a couple of different ways right here. He could show a fastball inside off the plate to keep Girardi honest and then go back away with the slider, or he could continue to pound him with breaking balls. Jarrett Wright trying to strike out the side here in the fourth inning. You guys talk about the physical presence of Jarrett Wright on the mound. Physically, you remind some here in Cleveland. I used to watch these Indians back in the 50s of Bob Feller, hard throwing right handed. Williams to his left. The rookies through four. Indians come to bat in the bottom of the fourth, up by three. Andy Pettit back to work in the bottom of the fourth inning. Indians coming to bat up by three. To remind you, this copyrighted telecast is presented by authority of the Commissioner of Baseball and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. And the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without expressed written consent. leads it off, bounced out to second his first time up. The 
Remember, we talked in the open about a high pitch count inning for Andy Pettit. Last inning, he threw 21 pitches and also threw several pickoff throws to first base. See if he's able to get that ball back down in the zone, get that cutter going here. Alomar chased one on 2-0. and oh, It's 2-1. and one. Really does Andy Pettit a favor here. That ball bounced just behind home plate. away from a guy like Sandy Alomar who loves to extend his arm. Chance of him putting the good part of the bat on the ball much greater. Watch the extension for Sandy Alomar. Opens up just a little bit. That's a sweet part of the bat right there. That's what that cutter does. It ties up right-handed batters. If they hit it well, they pull it foul. And if they don't hit it well, they either break their bats or hit it on the trademark. But that ball out over the plate like the one to Matt Williams. A leadoff double, a great start to the fourth inning for the Indians with Tommy Fernandez and Grissom coming up. Trying to add to their 3-0 lead. A strike from Pettit. Mendoza getting ready for the Yankees out of their bullpen. Third is Alomar with one out. In 496 at bats, over 600 plate appearances, Tommy did not sacrifice this year. But this is a pretty wise choice, I think, by Mike Hargrove. The reason is that Jim Tommy struck out 146 times by having him face Pettit, especially after giving him that one shot. He's liable to strike out and fail to move the runner. Andy Pettit, after bobbling the ball, throws out Tommy. First sack of the year for Tommy. Now the Yankees have to bring the infield in with Tony Fernandez at the plate. Alomar at third with one out. Field for O'Neill. Alomar tags and comes to the plate. Strong throw, but not in time. And it's 4 nothing Indians here in the fourth. The reason Joe Girardi went back to tag Alomar, I think he thought that Alomar may have slid late over his left leg. We've talked about it being a wise choice to have Tommy bunt there. Watch Girardi's left leg and the slide by Alomar. See, he came close to missing home plate. That's why Girardi made the tag. That's why the catcher puts that left leg out there. You make him go over you like a low hurdle, causing him to miss the plate. Alomar almost missed it then, and that's why Girardi went back. What a great throw by Paul O'Neill, even to make this a close play. Alomar does not run particularly well. A perfect one-off throw. Looks like he did miss the play. See, there's, not, there's no dirt on the play. Looks like he slid over the play. That was the intention of Girardi. You try to, instead of having you go through the leg, you try to have him go over the leg again like a low hurdle. Here it is again. He missed home plate. He's out. Ball one to Grissom, one and two. You may have seen home plate umpire Davey Phillips immediately pointed at home plate, indicating that he felt that Sandy Alomar did indeed 
touch home plate. If he felt Alomar had missed the plate, he would make no call whatsoever. Right. Still one and two on Grissom. He's going to look at it here from the... Uh, it appears maybe his left foot might have bounced yeah. on home plate, the very back tip of home plate, but judging from the slide mark, his slide definitely started after home plate, but apparently he got the top of that shoe down on the very back corner of home plate. Certainly looked like that from Dave Phillips' viewpoint, but that high third shot certainly looks like Alomar missed home plate. No going back now. Yet another look. Grissom strikes out on a terrible pitch. To put out at first to end the fourth. The Indians do get a run in the fourth inning. A leadoff double by Alomar. 4-0 Cleveland after four. Between innings, we have looked at this slide by Sandy Alomar in every way possible. Look at home plate right there. After the slide, it looked like he curled that knee up under and he did not touch home plate. We'll try to show you the slide mark, but it looked like he went past home plate and the knee was actually in the air before he made contact with the ground behind home plate. Nonetheless, it's 4-0 Indians here in the fifth inning, and Ray Sanchez, the number nine hitter, leads it off. It's 1-1. One one. Strike two on Sanchez. Jarrett Wright looking for his fifth strikeout of the night. Instead, a soft two hopper to short for Vizquiz. Leadoff man is gone for the Yankees in the fifth. One final look at the slide by Sandy Alomar, and we think this is the best evidence. It's a very close play. Was his knee on the plate, or did any part of his foot come in contact? Girardi forcing him to go over him. And look at the slide mark where his slide mark starts right there so he actually started his slide or at least that's the way i see it he started his slide when he was over home plate but certainly from davy phillips angle it looked like he touched it I feel like the highway patrol study of skid marks at the scene of an accident <laughs> <laughs> one out nobody on for tim rain that's a 10-4 only question in my mind was that left foot. If it caught the edge of home plate, not according to Dave Phillips, yep. the only opinion that counts, it did, and it's 4 0 Indian. Ball and a strike on range, who's one for two. Wright still hitting mid 90s on the radar gun working on a five hit shutout three and one so far Bob Bramley so much for the nerves for Jared Wright he is absolutely thriving in this atmosphere and four runs will help you settle in considerably, but he has shown no shy signs of rattling out there. The Yankees have tried to get in and out of the batter's box on him, slow down his rhythm. A one-out walk here is second walk of the night. Tomorrow on Fox, can three divorced guys juggle fatherhood and dating without losing their minds? Find out when Paul Reiser and Janine Garofalo star in the network premiere of Bye Bye Love tomorrow at 8 Eastern, 7 Central here on Fox.
going to be bye bye season unless the Yankees can score at least four runs before the ninth inning or before the tenth inning gets here. Keep this in mind. The Indians scored five against New York in game one. The Yankees won. The Yankees, on the other hand, scored three in the first inning against the Indians in game two. The Indians won. And the Yankees had a 2 nothing lead last night when the Indians won. One on, one out for Derek Jeter. Range is running. Throw by Alomar is awful into center field. And Range will head to third. Stolen base, E2, and the Yankees have a runner at third. Only one out here in the fifth. Well, the Yankees have definitely discovered a weakness in Jarrett Wright's game out there on the mound. The big high leg kick, the slow delivery to home plate. Reigns picks a breaking ball to run on, giving him even more of an advantage. And Alomar, in his haste to get that ball down there in a hurry, air mails it to Marquise Grissom in center field. set up at one and two right and this crowd need a strikeout Jeter spoiled one to keep it one and two Derek Jeter has gone deep twice in this series took a fastball from Jose Mesa in game two closed the game down to a two run game that the Indians hung on to to win to even this series at one apiece Runner at third here, one out. Two out. Derek Jeter having to take the first slider with Tim Raines running. And he takes the fastball. The fastball misses. Fouls off the fastball and look at the slider off the plate. This might be one of those games where the crowd of 45,000 plus will be more tired at the end of this game than the starting pitcher. How many times has that happened? Cool, calm, collected. Jarrett Wright. Here's Paul O'Neill with a runner at third, two out. One for two tonight. Seven hits in this series. series but I think they are dealing with a different sort in Jared Wright right now he owns this game his pitch.
Garrett Wright in the first inning had a runner at second range. Nobody out. Got around it. A runner at third, one out here in the fifth inning. One strike away from getting around another scoring chance for New York. got a lot of these Yankee hitters talking to themselves that's for sure through the first four and two-thirds inning it's a long way from pitching in front of 50 or 60 moms and pops three years ago at Capella High to pitching in front of in front of this Indians crowd that Paul O'Neill has been able to hang in during the course of this at bat is no surprise. Fouled off a backdoor slider right there, a pitch that you can't be looking for with a full count. You've got to respect that fastball inside, but O'Neill still able to get a pretty good rip and a breaking ball on the outside part of the plate. The two-out walk, second walk, handed out by Wright in this inning third of the night and it's first and third with two out while the Indians have been waiting for Manny Ramirez to click it in and he did with a two out two run double later scored a run in that three run third inning the Yankees are waiting for the same from Bernie Williams season home run. up to that high fastball from Garrett Wright and here the fans go again. I think the seventh inning stretch in this game would be redundant. <laughs> delivers with a two out base hit. A double dose for the Yankees. First they hit by Williams. Drives in one run. Rain scores. Paul O'Neill credit him for running hard all the way in case something happens and something happened. Ramirez drops the ball. O'Neill comes around to score. He would not have been able to score if he's not running hard all the way. Williams to second. You have to take the good with the bad with Manny Ramirez. He's been known to butcher a ball or two out there in right field and get picked off first base. 
walk off the field with two outs in the inning, and there you see Paul O'Neill, as you said, hustling all the way around. Cuts the lead in half. It's a single, one RBI, E9, to allow O'Neill to score. A two-run inning, a two-run lead for Cleveland. Now Williams at second with two outs. Dying run at the plate for the Yankees, it's Tino Martinez. And a little pop-up for Wright to end the inning. Halfway through it in game five, the deciding game of this division series. Indians lead by two. 1997 American League Division Series on Fox is brought to you by Park Avenue by Buick. Welcome to Park Avenue, the power of understatement. By Burger King, where you get your burgers worth. By Gillette Sensor Excel and the Gillette Series. Gillette, the best a man can get. And by Dr. Pepper and your local Dr. Pepper bottler. Dr. Pepper, this is the taste. Welcome back to Jacobs Field in Cleveland. Again, we remind you that providing our shots from above is the Goodyear Blimp Stars and Stripes. It was 1960 when the Goodyear Blimps first began live sports coverage at the Orange Bowl. Still looking down from above as we get into the bottom of the fifth inning. Bib Roberts leads it off and takes a strike top of the order. Roberts is putting together a terrific series, six out of 18. Oh, and two. I love Davey Phillips' strike call. He looks like somebody pulling a hot sheet out of a dryer. Both hands go up. In the dirt, Girardi picks it up and flips it to first. Second strikeout for Andy Pettit. So with one out here in the bottom of the fifth inning, we remind you this week it's a Fox NFL Sunday doubleheader. It all starts with America's most watched pregame show. Then catch an NFC Central battle as the Packers clash with the Bears. Followed by the Rams and the 49ers, plus other regional action. Coverage begins at noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific, right here on Fox. One out, nobody on for Vizquel. Ball one. from Andy Pettit. Now Brian Bullringer gets ready for New York in their bullpen. At the end of last night's game, he was the only one left out there for Joe Torres. Two and two. Well, we said Bip Roberts is putting together a terrific series for Cleveland. You can say that again and underline it twice for Omar Vizquel. See what he did in his career in the postseason in 95 and 96. Compared to this season, hitting 500 in this series. Still two and two. Also three stolen bases for Omar in this series in his last stolen base, leading to a run. He scored the second run on the double by Manny Ramirez. Rich Steinbrenner wondering if Tonight's it for 1997. That's off the end of the bat for a range of left. Crossing the line in foul territory. Two up. Come on, Manny. Go, come on, buddy. Tim Raines with a long way to run on this foul ball. He plays a very deep left field, no matter what ballpark they're playing in. You mentioned the ball hit off the end of the bat. Doesn't carry very well. Tim Raines a long way to run. Check that tarp to see where he was in relation to that wall over there. Makes a nice catch. That'll bring in Manny Ramirez. Doubled home a couple. Later scored a run in the third inning, but committed an error in right. To allow a run to score for the Yankees in the top of this inning, so his plus-minus rating is plus two. <laughs> 
Two out, nobody on. And a 1-1 count on Ramirez. It's like Don Zimmer and Joe Torre talking about the possible pitching matchups when the Yankees go back out there with Matt Williams hitting fourth. But he'll be followed by David Justice, the left-hander. It's a different Indian lineup. Tommy and Justice don't bat back-to-back -back in this game. Looks like Don Zimmer's looking at uh, Matt Williams right now. Two out, nobody on. Two and two on Ramirez. Don Zimmer certainly knows what Matt Williams is capable of doing. He was a coach on the staff with Roger Craig when the San Francisco Giants called up a young Matt Williams to play shortstop during the 1987 season. Green two. Matt Williams didn't play in that postseason against the Cardinals that year, but he did play against the Chicago Cubs in 1989, and who was the manager of the Cubs? Don Zimmer. Just pops up everywhere. 50 major league ballparks. Steve Jacobson of Newsday in New York telling me before the game that he and Zimmer figured it out. He's been to 50 major league ballparks. Great two to Ramirez. Do it again. You know better than I would know, Bob, but when the Giants called up Matt Williams in 1987, Don Zimmer and Roger Craig both knew Williams enough to know that a young Matt Williams could handle anything that he was handed in the big leagues and begged the front office to call him up. Well, there was some concern as to whether emotionally he could handle it because they were pretty sure he was going to struggle offensively, at least initially in the big leagues. They both agreed that this was a guy that could handle it. Much like Jarrett Wright pitching game five of the division series. You not only have to know the physical makeup of your personnel, what they're capable of doing between the white lines, but what are they capable of doing between their ears? Again, the three to the Ramirez. Another foul. From that call up in 1987 to the Giants, to these numbers in over 1,200 career games. His season in 1994 was off to one of the best starts ever. The strike hit and the curtain came down. Three two to Ramirez. Martinez feeds Andy Pettit, and it's a 1 2 3 fifth inning. We move to the sixth there in Cleveland. Indians back to the field, up by two. Welcome back to Jacobs Field here in Cleveland, Ohio. We have played five in the sixth inning. For the Yankees, it will be Stanley, Hayes, and Girardi. So far, so good for the choice of Joe Torre to call Mike Stanley into his lineup and put the DH label on him. He's two for two. Why Mike Stanley and not Cecil Fielder? Cecil Fielder, a better low ball hitter. Jared Wright doesn't throw a lot of low pitches. And at the knees to Stanley, one and one. center field and Stanley is three for three all the way to the wall and Mike Stanley has a leadoff double here in the sixth inning pretty good 
good hitting right there, huh, Bob? Oh, that's great hitting. Stanley with an uppercut swing from the right side of the plate. The pitch out over the plate, down low, stays right on it, drives it into the gap, exactly what you're supposed to do with that fastball down low and away. Looks like Grissom might have had a chance to cut that ball off when it was initially hit, but once again, the grass a little wet here at Cleveland at night. Here to pick up speed when it hit the ground and skipped all the way to the wall. It's Mark Wiley, the pitching coach, visits with Jared Wright. He's up to 104 pitches on the night, trying to protect the two-run sixth inning lead. We talked about it in game one of this division series. Joe Torre's uncanny ability to call on the right guy in the right situation. He did it last year throughout the postseason. He's had reins in his lineup. Throughout this series with Cleveland, he calls on Stanley tonight. Mike is three for three. A consideration here is a pinch runner for Mike Stanley because by the time the DH spot comes up again, Jared Wright's not going to be in the ball game. So Cecil Fielder could conceivably be the pinch hitter for the DH. I wonder if that's what Joe and Don Zimmer are talking about now. It's Charlie Hayes, and that's strike one on high heat from Jared Wright. If that run were a tying or go-ahead run, they would definitely do it. But if Bob Stanley or a pinch runner were to score, or Mike Stanley, I beg your pardon, if he scores, then it would draw it within one. One ball, one strike. You can't see the face, but that is Wade Falk down the tunnel with a bat in hand, cranking it up, starting to get loose. 1-1 one, one to Hayes. 2-1 as Jarrett Wright is struggling here in the sixth inning. Yeah, there's nobody out, and Ray Sanchez is in the hole. If Boggs does come in the game, Charlie Hayes could move to second base and have Boggs come in at third. That's the flexibility that Joe Torre has. A two on to Hayes. Vizquel takes care of it. One out. Well, we talked about Jared Wright and how some here in the Cleveland area, he reminds them of Rapid Robert, Bob Feller, one of the hardest throwers this game has ever seen. Struck out over 2,500 hitters. His number retired here with the Indians. Six 20-win seasons for Bob Feller, and a Hall of Famer went in in 1962. Well, Jarrett Wright has the socks down, Pat. We know that much. Jarrett Wright will now deal with Wade Boggs as they call on the veteran third baseman off the bench for New York. Here you see the Bob Feller-like high socks. Pants are a little bit more snug than Mr. Feller wore, though. Bog steps in, hitting for Girardi. Joe 0 for 2 tonight. 2 out of 15 in this series. As usual, Boggs looks at the first pitch. It's ball one. I think you have to be thinking about this. If you pinch hit for Wade Boggs and Wade gets on, then you probably pinch hit for Ray Sanchez. And since Jose P Jorge Posada is already in the game, he's the only other catcher, then you might pinch hit Posada for Ray Sanchez. Move Boggs to third, Hayes to second, and Posada's automatically in the game. There's Posada. Back of the New York dugout. Runner at second here. One out. The 1-1 one -one to Bond. Right falls behind. 2-1. and one. They have Andy Fox and Pose left on the bench along with 
Curtis and Fielder. The shot of the switch hitting catcher is Boggs. Shoots one down the left field line. Slicing foul for strike two. Where does Wade Boggs rank among active players? Number three, an average hit, walks, and on-base percentage. Reached up and poked it foul, still two and two. Balls is another guy throughout his career has been a master of fouling off tough pitches with two strikes. He actually goes after a ball way out of the strike zone right here. A very short, abbreviated swing, a lot of risk, able to wait a long time on the pitch. Three and two. The fact that he fouled all those fastballs off forced Wright into throwing the slider. Boggs represents the tying run at the plate here in the sixth inning. Hit only four home runs during the regular season. Up the middle and through for a hit. Here comes Stanley. Grissom no throw, and it's a one-run game as Wade Boggs delivers off the bench for Joe Torre and the Yankees. What an at-bat by Wade Boggs. There have been two key at-bats. In the last two innings, Paul O'Neill with two out in the fifth inning, and now Wade Boggs, a fastball for a strike. 0-2, oh 1-2, and two. One and two. still 1-2, one and two. still 1-2. and two. Now the 3-2 pitch back up the middle. Terrific hitting by Wade Boggs. And Mike Hargrove started out of the dugout, right, then came back because the pinch hitter I think he was waiting to see if there would be a pinch hitter and he quickly made an about face and went back into the dugout and it's Sanchez at the plate right now but a chance we could see Posada Jared Wright will be lifted here in the sixth inning with the Indians up by one Folks, don't forget to tune in to Game 4 of the American League Championship Series for the $1 million Gillette Strike Zone Challenge, where one fan will have the opportunity to throw a strike. $1 million. And that ALCS will begin here on Fox on Wednesday night. Jared Wright is finished here in the sixth inning, and there are the numbers for the 21-year-old right-hander. From talking to Mike Hargrove this afternoon down in his office, he mentioned Mike Jackson, what a great job he's done for the Indians this year, but he does have problems getting the ball inside on left-handed hitter. It was a straight fastball, a sinking fastball, and a slider that he will work all around the zone, inside, outside, up and down, but has trouble getting that ball inside occasionally on the left-handed hitter. Posada up there, ready to swing, strike one. Jorge Posada off the bench to bat for Ray Sanchez. Will end the night 0 for 2, and Posada needs a new bat. That bat may have had a hairline fracture before he swung it. He hit that ball on the fat part of the bat and broke it. Sometimes with all that pine tar, you can't tell whether it's broken or not. Usually you don't break a bat on that swing. But that's an example of what you're talking about, Bob. That slider, he did not get it inside to Posada. And that seems to be the pitch most effective, that slider. It's a pitch that would be low and away to a right-handed batter. And a left-hander, that ball is right in the sweet spot. Down and into a left, he's no good. either a change up or Mike Jackson just takes something off his fastball gets some good sinking motion at the end normally his fastball is in the mid 90s that pitch at 88 miles an hour the 
In the past, Jackson has gone up and in with a fastball on this count and then tried the backdoor slider one and two. Rosada spoiled a nasty pitch low and away. It's still 0 and 2. Appeared to be another change up again. The ball sinking down as it approached home plate. Defensive swing by Posada to stay alive. Wouldn't chase it. One and two. Jackson got the win here last night. He ended up pitching an inning and a third. And he's right back into the action the next night. We're only in the sixth. Posada still alive. Foul ball that hit his foot while in the batter's box. And the Alomar jumps out in front of home plate and fields this ball. It hit the ground first and then hit the inside of the right fly by a Posada. Alomar trying to convince Davey Phillips that that was a routine ground ball in front of home plate and he retired it. <laughs> Might as well take a shot at it. You never know. <laughs> Still one and two. Boy, we have had seen some gritty at bats by both side hitters tonight. Fox delivered one off the bench for the Yankees with the RBI single that spelled the end of the night for Jarrett Wright here in the sixth. Paul O'Neill earlier to work a walk out of Wright in the fifth. you can add Posada's name on that list. Yeah, I think the reason Posada is able to battle so much this at bat, Mike Jackson has not shown him a good fastball yet in this at bat. He's gone after him with sliders and changeups. Normally, Mike Jackson would show you a good hard fastball somewhere inside during the course of an at bat so he would have a speed to change up from. But he has not gone to that good fastball. Posada's been able to foul off all the off-speed pitches. Two and two. There was a fastball there. Bringing Jackson in with one out and Boggs on at first leads you to believe that this might be the only inning that Jackson will be called on. He pitched last night, had great stuff last night, but a tough time trying to retire Posada. Still two and two. Mike Hargrove telling us before the game that yes, Jackson is available but he might be working some on the adrenaline of pitching in game five as opposed to just relying on a good live arm. Yeah, because he does not have the stuff tonight that he had last night. Not even close. away from Mike Jackson. Great movement late in the strike zone. And a great location. Jared Wright, now just a spectator. Plotting the efforts of Mike Jackson in a 10-pitch at bat with Posada. And now back to the top of the New York lineup in Tim Raines. run at first two out here in the sixth inning hard hit but right at Tony Fernandez Jackson comes in and does his thing welcome back to Jacobs Field in Cleveland Ohio it's a one run game into the bottom of the sixth inning these two games have been games to wear you out they have worn me out, I'll tell you that. What about the players? Think of what it's doing to them and this crowd here. 
<laughs> what about the manager? <laughs> oh, man, this has really been a nerve-wracking last couple of days, but uh, this is the way you want it. This is what postseason baseball is supposed to be all about, and as nerve-wracking and tense as it is, tremendously excited. Boggs takes over at third base after delivering a pinch hit RBI single. Tim McCarver called it as Charlie Hayes moves over to second base, and Jorge Posada takes over behind the plate. to work is Pennant facing Williams and a strike to the outside corner. I have to admit, Tim, when you said they could move Charlie Hayes to second, I thought, what are you talking about? <laughs> there Our he is at he, second base. He's played second five times this year. Steve Horn had researched that before the game. I mean, second base has been a position, the most unstable position for the Yankees. They have used seven different second basemen this year and six starting second basemen. And there's another one, Andy Fox, waiting in the wings. Williams pops it up to start the bottom of the sixth inning, inning and Charlie Hayes just switching to that position nearly dropped it low snow cone right here <laughs> this, is, this is like he's carrying eight or nine snow cones watch a little white dripping out of the glove after that ball's about waist high there it is so you put one player out there playing out of position i don't care where you put him the first ball of the inning is going to be hit to it it'll find you won't it <laughs> Matt Williams now one for three, the first out in the sixth inning, and now David Justice. The breaking ball from Pettit for strike one. Hitless tonight is Justice with a couple of ground outs. There he is again. Found him twice. Charlie Hayes is taking care of the first two outs here in the sixth inning and now has a big smile and shares a laugh with Derek Jeter over at short. It's time now for our Miller Lite game summary. The Indians, three runs on four hits in the third inning. Manny Ramirez finally broke through for Cleveland. Alomar, leadoff double, scored a run in the fourth inning. It was 4 nothing. Yankees got two in the fifth inning. As Bernie Williams finally broke through for New York. And then Wade Boggs delivering off the bench in the top of this sixth inning to make it a one-run game. Along with Tim McCarver and Bob Brenly, I'm Joe Buck. Glad to have you with us. Deciding Game 5. This division series, which has been everything you could have hoped for as a baseball fan. The winner of this game will move on to the ALCS to start Wednesday night here on Fox in Baltimore. Cheater takes care of Alomar. And Pettit takes care of the Indians in the sixth. Back for the seventh after this from your local Fox station. Seventh inning of game five. Mike Jackson back to work. Protecting a one-run Indian lead with Jeter, O'Neill, and Bernie Williams coming up. The breaking ball as Jeter showed the bunt. Strike one. He's Kept trying to push that ball to the right side. Mike Jackson has had knee problems throughout his career. Does not really feel his position well out there. Peter thought he pulled that bat back in time. Davy Phillips didn't think so. Reaching, it's 0-2. That is a totally different slider than what Jackson was throwing to Posada. Watch the bite on this baby. Woo. I think this might be Jackson's last guy. Paul Ossenmacher is warming up. Yeah, Bernie, Paul O'Neill, Bernie Williams, Tino Martinez coming up. Jackson will pitch to one more guy. And incidentally, both corners, there's Ossenmacher on the right, Jose Mesa on the left. Both corners, Williams at third, Tommy at first on the line. 
One and two on Jeter, who's 0 for 3 tonight. It's particularly important to put Tommy on the line with two strikes on Jeter because of his propensity to go the other way. But Williams has to guard the line as well because we've seen Derek Jeter adjust his swing during the course of the at-bat. His count. Got no safe. First base umpire, Rocky Roll, first put up the fist and then changed his mind mid-call and called Jeter safe. And that's the way we start the seventh inning, but no doubt that Rocky Roll first called him out and midstream changed to a safe call. And I think that's what Mike Hargrove is going to argue with Rocky Rowe. Looked like the throw beat him. Fine play by Omar Vizquel. The naked eye looked like the throw beat him was Tommy off the bag. And that's the kind of a swing that a right-hander will get down the line the quickest on. Uh, he was out. Yankees got a huge break right there. He's out. And Tommy clearly on the bag. See him with the little punch signal out and then the change of mind, change of heart, and the safe call given, and the tying run is on to start the seventh inning. Why he changed his mind. Looked, like, looked, to me to like, looked to me like he was right the first time. Nonetheless, the leadoff man is on here in the seventh inning, and Ossenmacher in for Cleveland. Yankees with a huge break, as you will see. The ball is in the glove of Jim Tomey, the first baseman, right there. Now watch. Jeter's foot now hits the bag. Rocky Rowe had it right the first time. The right hand almost goes up, and now it's a safe call. And Jeter clapping, and the Indians furious. Here's Ossenmacher with O'Neill, Williams, and Martinez coming up. Just to refresh your memory from last night, Paul Ossenmacher, a breaking ball pitcher, big sweeping slider. We'll throw it at the left-handed hitter, break it across the plate for a strike. He'll start it over the plate and break it out of the zone. Oh, that's right. And there's that pickoff move, which won't fool many. <laughs> Jeter is on to start the inning on a terrible break for the Indians. And Ossenmacher faces O'Neill, who is homered against him. Game one and singled off Ossenmacher here last night. A strike. It was Paul O'Neill who hit the final home run in the back-to-back-to-back Three consecutive home runs in that five-run sixth inning. The game one victory for the Yankees, 8-6. Off Ossenmacher. Diving stop, Tolman. What a play for the out at second. <laughs> for Brother. Brilliant play by Jim Tomey. This is actually two good plays. One to stop the ball and watch the position he's in when he makes this throw. <laughs> Not quite sitting down, falling over backwards towards the middle of the infield. Boy, a potential for disaster right here on this throw, but he puts it right on the money. O'Neill thought he got Asenmacher again. If that ball's through, the Yankees have first and third and nobody out. Not only is the out recorded, but the faster guy off the bases now. It's O'Neill at first with one out for Bernie Williams. And a strike from Asenmacher. The 
The Indians trying to get around that missed call at first base, which started this seventh. One on, one out. One and one on Williams. Again, our thanks for the many spectacular overhead shots to Captain Jim Maloney and the crew of the Goodyear Blimp Stars and Stripes based out of Pompano Beach, Florida. They get that unique angle of what has been a terrific series as we move into the bottom of the seventh inning. Indians to bat. Hanging on to a one-run lead in the deciding game five of this series with New York. Tommy Fernandez and Grissom. It's about time to start talking about the job Andy Pettit has done here tonight. Struggled early. Has settled down. Kept his team in the game. Breaking ball strike two. The difference in this game, the run scored by Sandy Alomar after Tomey had bunted him to third base, I beg your pardon, to second base, and then this play by Tomey, and as Bob said, probably the throw was better than the play he made to stop the ball from going to the outfield. Back to Pettit. Has time and from his knees takes care of Tomey, one out. That's 10 in a row retired by Andy Pettit. But not without a few extra palpitations on that <laughs> ground ball back to the mound. Well, we've talked throughout his two starts in the postseason here. What a great defensive pitcher he is. That was almost too easy of a play for him. Come backer. Makes a nice play and then after losing the ball that's when the palpitation set and he's got it right there and then loses the handle. And right about now, that's like trying to grab a hold of a greased pig. Now Tony Fernandez. The sacrifice flying to right his last time up. For the fourth run of the night for the Indians, they lead 4-3. Pettit with a funny reaction after delivering that ball to home plate. Taking a lot of time before getting back up on the rubber. He may have landed wrong out there on the mound and tweaked that back or leg. Posada out to have a visit to make sure he's okay. You can see Joe Girardi point to his left shoulder after the one of, I should say, Jorge Posada. Watch him point to the left shoulder. When a catcher does that, He's telling the pitcher to keep the shoulder closed, and maybe the reason it wasn't closed is that bad back you were talking about, Bob. Trying to get through seven, one out, nobody on, and now three and zero on Fernandez. is next. To the second baseman. Diving stop Charlie Hayes. What a play. Two gone. We 
know Charlie Hayes has got a strong arm. This is a very unusual play for a third baseman. He doesn't usually take four steps before a dive at third base. You know he's got plenty of arm left to make that play. And normally at third base, it's a step and a dive, maybe a step and a half and a dive. That time, Charlie Hayes had a chance to run three or four steps before making his dive. And after that hard hit ball up the middle, Joe Torre makes his way out to the mound with Marquise Grissom coming up. Got a shot earlier of Jeff Nelson, the right-hander, out in the New York bullpen, and that's where Joe Torre will go. Andy Pettit leaves. He gets into the seventh inning. Tried to keep the Yankees in it, and they are. We are in inning number seven. Two out, nobody on for the Indians. They lead by one. Bottom of the seventh inning with the Indians leading by one and at the plate with two out, nobody on. Remember Wednesday, it's game one of the American League Championship Series. When one of these two teams will head to Baltimore, they'll clash against the AL Eastern Division champion Orioles. Coverage begins live at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific, right here on Fox on Wednesday night. Great performance by Andy Pettit. Allowed the four runs in the ball game, but really only made a few mistakes. Unfortunately for him and the Yankees, the Indians made him pay for those mistakes, but seemed to get stronger as the game went on. Jeff Russell, on the other hand, is facing a similar position that he faced, or Jeff Nelson, a similar position that he faced last night, facing Marquise Grissom. Joe Torre and Joe Girardi. Of course, Girardi started the game. Posada in there now. But they have been trying to encourage Nelson to throw more fastballs. Forget the slider, throw the fastball. He threw three to Grissom last night, and they got him out. See what Posada puts down with two out, nobody on here in the seventh. A breaking ball for a strike. You know, many times when a pitcher has a gimmick pitch or a trick pitch, in this case the sidearm slider from Jeff Nelson, they want to throw at every pitch. Nelson also has a great fastball. They clocked him 92, 93 in the ball game last night. There's 90 on one up and in, one and one. And great movement because of the angle of delivery. One and two now on Grissom, who has a hit and a run scored in this game five. You see the delivery from Jeff Nelson. Little hitch in the middle right there, little hesitation. Low three quarters that time. He will drop down further than that on occasion. To the left side for Jeter. The Indians go in order in the seventh into the eighth Martinez Stanley Hayes coming up for New York down by a run. Ryan Giles takes over in left field for defensive reasons as we get into the eighth inning with the Indians leading 4 three along with producer John Filippelli director Bill Webb Bill Buck Bob Brenly Tim McCarver Indians got three in the third added one in the fourth inning. Led 4 nothing. Yankees came back with two in the fifth, one in the sixth. It's a 4-3 game in this deciding game five of this division series. The winner heads to the ALCS to take on the Orioles. Tino Martinez, one and one. Mike Hargrove has Matt Williams playing regularly. Jim Tomey on the line at first. Big swing by Martinez, one and two.
Martinez spoils that pitch. The end of tonight's game. Tim, Bob, and I will select the Chevy truck player of the game. The numbers for the Yankees under Joe Torre this season in one run game. Behind home plate for Alomar. Looks like Tino Martinez got a pretty good breaking ball to hit there with two strikes, but lifted it high in the air behind home plate. And the Alomar doing it just like you're supposed to. Got rid of the mask, short steps as you get closer to the ball. Yeah, I think this is a very dangerous at bat for the Cleveland Indians right here. Mike Stanley has really been locked in throughout the ball game. Paul Ossenmacher with that big sweeping breaking ball. And you figured this was going to happen. Mike Cargrove takes the ball from Ossenmacher. One perfect inning from the veteran left-hander here in game five tonight. Hard-throwing right-hander Jose Mesa. Takes over for the Indians here in the eighth inning, trying to protect a one run lead. Mike Stanley first up back in game two in the eighth inning with the bases loaded facing Mesa. Jose Mesa drilled him to force in a run. Prior to tonight, Mike Stanley's only at bat in this series. Tonight, he's three for three. One out, nobody on in the eighth inning. Strike one. And in game two, we showed you the numbers for Stanley career against Mesa. And you may have seen Stanley flexing that left arm right there. Probably a little stiffness still in that bicep area from getting drilled. In that highlight we just showed you. Jared Wright tonight starter still in the dugout watching Stanley up now Hayes on deck strike two on Mike Stanley good breaking ball from Jose Mesa somebody needs to tell these fans the seventh inning stretch is over <laughs> One out, nobody on. Two and two. What do you mean? They sat down for the seventh inning stretch. <laughs> seventh inning rest. <laughs> Last night made as much noise as we've run into in the two years we've been doing this. Mm. Two balls, two strikes. Get Stanley out. The breaking ball. The slider misses. Another breaking ball. The breaking ball misses. Five straight breaking balls. Four curves and a slider to get Stanley. Two out, nobody on for Charlie Hayes. We came in talking about the velocity of. The pitches from Jared Wright. Mace is right there in that same neighborhood. One and one.
it's important that the Yankees get a couple of runners on even if they don't score because what that will do it'll guarantee Jeter and O'Neill in particular the two guys that have been the hottest up in the ninth inning so even if they don't score if they get a base runner or two then you've got the meat of the order two and two on Charlie Hayes. for a two-out base hit. Andy Fox is a faster runner than Charlie Hayes, plus Andy Fox is a second baseman. We'll see if Joe Torre goes to a pinch runner here. It's not that Hayes is slow. He's just not as fast as Fox. And if Hayes' position gets up again, well, then at least the Yankees would have tied it in all probability in a nine inning game players at a premium obviously Jose Mesa trying to shut down the top of the eighth Wade Boggs now Boggs faced Mesa in that eighth inning after Stanley was hit by a pitch and popped up. And now Andy Fox will indeed come off the bench and run for Charlie Hayes. I think this gives Joe Torrey more options right now. And the Yankees have to concern themselves right now. If they do put the hit and run on and Boggs perhaps swings through it, or Fox is fast enough to steal the base. Mesa does not have a good move to first base. 2 and 0. You can see Mesa does use that very abbreviated slide step to home. Would be tough to get a jump on if they were going to straight steal a base. Mm -hmm. That's odd for a power pitcher, too. Normally, you don't generate as much power with the slide step. Two and one from Jose Mesa. And more big numbers against this hard throwing right hander. Two and two. That's a dangerous pitch from Mason. I'll tell you why. The outfield has shifted. Grissom in left center, Giles in left center. Look at the gap into right center field. And he comes back with a fastball on the inside part of the plate. Up the middle, through into right center, and now Andy Fox is off to the races. Digging for third, they'll hold him there, and it's first and third, two out. Boggs is two for two. shift didn't hurt him because Andy Fox is going to go to third on that ball anyway regardless of how the outfield was but Wade Box could have gone to second base were it not for a fine play from Manny Ramirez watch how quickly Ramirez gets to the ball and throws it to second to prevent the potential go ahead run from going to second base Fox had an idea about going home if Ramirez bobbles that ball a little bit I think Willie Randolph sends it It's up to young Jorge Posada. As Mesa's come on to strike out Stanley, but back to back two out hits by Hayes and Boggs. Indians lead by one in the eighth. The 
runners in scoring position tonight. The Yankees hitting 200. The Indians much better. Posada's second at bat of the night. He struck out back in the sixth. Jacobs Field bottom of the eighth inning with the Indians leading by a run they are three outs away defensively from a return trip to the ALCS for the first time since 1995 Andy Fox takes over at second base and the Indians want insurance runs here in their half of the eighth with Giles to lead it off This Kell and Ramirez will follow. Nelson back to work. Into left field for Rain. One pinch, one out here in the bottom of the eighth inning. I'll take the point you made about the Yankees sending enough batters to the plate to roll it over to the top of the order has come true. The Yankees are having their top of the order up in the ninth. Particularly their two hottest hitters, Derek Jeter and Paul O'Neill. Here is Vizquel, who has been so good in this series, both at the plate, on the bases, and you can even throw in the glove work, which is taken for granted with Vizquel. The bunt. Tough play, Posada. Forget it. Face hit. could be a bunt for a double the way Vizquel runs because Jeff Nelson does not have a quick move to first base he does have a slide step and that's why Vizquel put it down look for him to run somewhere in the next five or six pitches perfectly executed bunt for a base hit hit it right off the end of the bat so that the ball did not rebound didn't give the Yankees a chance to make a play now Mel Stottlemyre out of the Yankees dugout to talk to the infield and his battery of Posada and Nelson. You know the one thing we have not seen in this remarkable five game series one pitch out. We have not seen a pitch out in the series. Not one. There have been numerous opportunities. Yeah. Runners at first base with the potential to steal. Pitcher ahead in the count, 0 2 1 2. Normally, situations where you might anticipate a pitch out. Yeah. Well, if you're ever going to pitch out, now might be the time to do it sometime in the next two or three pitches because this scale is going to run. Matter of when. Now, Manny Ramirez. One big swing tonight. A two out two run double. Later scored and a hit by Williams back in the three run third inning for the Indians. If this gal does run, he's going to earn it because Posada has a gun behind the plate. Excellent throwing catcher. That's the sign that the Yankees use for the pickoff at first base. A five followed by a one. And much like Joe Girardi last night, you saw Jorge Posada shake his head no. Get Jeff Nelson to shake off a sign out there. 
try to lure that base runner Vizquel at first base into believing that a pitch was going to be delivered to home plate. catch two down back to first is Vizquel and in walks Matt Williams I think Manny Ramirez may have taken one pitch to give Vizquel a chance to run he couldn't take two see what Matt Williams does it's rare that a power hitter will take a pitch to allow a runner to steal a base because that pitch might be the long ball. You can walk home instead of run. One for three tonight with an RBI hit back in the third. Strike one. And leading after eight, the Indians. 79 wins, only three losses this season. You would anticipate Nelson going after Matt Williams with a series of sliders outside. He's going to beat you, make him do it to the opposite field. That tailing fastball that Nelson throws would work back to the inside part of the plate on Matt Williams. one of the series. <laughs> A pitch out and Omar was not biting. Well, not many managers call back to back pitch outs. It's been done before. But usually after one pitch out, the manager will let that pitcher deliver the next pitch to home plate. Probably after a pickoff attempt. There he goes. Posada's throw. Not in time. And the stolen base for Vizquel. His fourth of this series. It was as good as a pitch out because the pitch was a fastball up and away, but no chance to get Vizquel. Tremendous jump at first base. Fine throw by Posada. Watch the fastball right there. No chance. Matt Williams with a two out hit could add to the one run Cleveland lead. Fans on their feet here with two strikes on the hitter, but for a different reason this time. Don't forget that Wednesday night we will all be in Baltimore for game one. The 1997 ALCS. These two teams knocking each other around trying to get there.
Still two and two. Matt Williams a little frustrated with himself. He knows that's probably the best fastball he's going to get to hit in this sequence. Wasn't able to come up with it. Justice next. So David Justice is not going to be facing Jeff Nelson. He'll be facing Mike Stanton in all probability. Should Williams get aboard one way or the other. Runner at second, two out. for the second time tonight. Mike Stanton will come in out of the bullpen for the Yankees. David Justice will be first up for Cleveland, trying to bust it open here in the eighth. Skips field in the bottom of the eighth inning. Indians trying to add runs and three outs away from the ALCS. Tuesday, it's game one of the NLCS. It's Gary Sheffield and the Florida Marlins head to Atlanta to take on Greg Maddox and the Atlanta Braves. Don't miss these two National League rivals at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific on NBC. That's on Tuesday night. On Wednesday night, game one of the ALCS here on Fox in Baltimore. Who will the other team be? Mike Stanton, the left-hander, takes over with two on, two out, and Justice first up. You may remember in the eighth inning of last night's game, Mike Stanton facing David Justice, throwing three fastballs that split the outside corner. Unhittable pitches. We'll see how he's going to work him tonight. Another Indian who has had a very strong series is Justice. Two on, two out. Indians leading by one eighth inning. Breaking ball had Justice. Those knees buckling, strike one. A knee locker, it sure was. <laughs> the numbers for Justice with runners in scoring position this season. Good at transition to a new league, as you'll see. You do not want to be in doubt as far as pitch selection is concerned. Stanton has stepped off twice if you're Posada. You've got to go out there and make sure. Fastball, strike two. A little giddy up on that fastball right there. I think it's odd. Mike Stanton pitches from the third base side of the rubber facing a left-handed batter. Normally a left-handed pitcher would work the first base side to give himself the best possible angle with that breaking ball. Gives you an idea of how he's going to work him. He, four of the last five strikes thrown to justice have been fastballs. Two on, two out for the Indians. Up by a run in the eighth. Nicely blocked by Posada, one and two. This is why Mike Stanton is staying away from David Justice. Those hot areas on the hands in, down and in, of course the middle of the plate. Most major league hitters have that hot, hot zone there. Jose Cardinal waving Bernie Williams, the center fielder, in, over toward left center.
over. These two teams have squeezed just about everything they can out of this best of five series. The back to back to back guys in the ninth inning for the Yankees with the Indians three outs away from the ALCS. Jose Mesa has one save in this series. Number two would put the Indians in the 1997 ALCS. Top of the order for the Yankees, down by a run, ninth inning, Range, Jeter, and O'Neill. Up the middle, Fernandez to his right, good play. You often hear about outfielders getting good jumps on the ball, and you rarely hear about infielders getting good jumps. The reason that this play looked as easy as it was was because of the jump that Fernandez had to his right. Anticipation's a great thing, and Tony had it then. The Indians two outs away. Now Derek Jeter. He went. Jeter, a home run against Mesa in game two. To the third baseman, Williams. One out of one. center field Grissom will not get there off the wall off the bat of O'Neill trying for two sink for the double Paul O'Neill may be hurt it looked like his right knee curled up under him on that slide a brilliant slide to the inside of the bag he didn't catch the bag with his feet. He caught it with his right hand. Gene Monahan, the trainer, out to look at him. He has to be totally immobile to drag him out of there right now. Telling Joe Torre he's all right, trying to walk it off. A scary slide and a blistering liner to right center field. The ball hitting the wall. A great carom by Grissom. And watch the throw on the bare hand retrieval. Maximum effort from Paul O'Neill. Gutty Plate getting himself into scoring position. He does not have the greatest speed on the Yankees team. He knows if he gets to second base, his team's got a chance. Very dangerous slide. And O'Neill is lifted for the pinch runner. Got Pose, the tying run at second with two out. And Bernie Williams, who has a hit tonight, only two in this division series. Into left center field. Giles is there. Celebrate.
is no MVP of the division series. We'll give tonight Chevy Truck player of the game to Omar Vizquel. One of a handful of players who stood out in this series for the victorious Cleveland Indians. for the first time since 1995. Back to Cleveland in a minute. 21-year-old phenom Jared Wright. Did you ever imagine a year ago pitching an A-ball you'd be beating the Yankees twice in the playoffs? It's amazing. It's, uh, it's awesome. It's great feeling. It, was your heart in your throat in the ninth inning? Oh, yeah. I mean, a close game, great, great ball game. And uh, we pulled it out. And, uh, Nothing you can say right now. Everybody said that pitching was the weak spot for this Indian ball club in the playoffs. You guys have been the underdogs all year long. Now you're the underdogs again when you take on the Orioles. What about this ball club heading into the next round now? I mean, you saw the heart. I mean, sometimes it's not, uh, you know, the numbers, it, it, it comes down to heart, and this team's got a lot of it. So I like our chances. And are you sure you're 21 the way you pitched? <laughs> <laughs> That's what my first certificate says. Big win for Jarrett Wright. Congratulations. Good luck against the Orioles. Joe Buck, it's wild down here. Back to you upstairs at the J. Thank you, Chip. Great work tonight. Congratulations to the Cleveland Indians back in the ALCS. A return trip the first time since 1995. And for the Yankees, no chance to defend their world title of a year ago. Wednesday, it's game one of the American League Championship Series when the Indians head to Baltimore where they'll clash with the AL Eastern Division champion Orioles. Our coverage begins live at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific on Fox. What a night for young Jared Wright and these wonderful fans here at Jacobs Field in Cleveland. They lit this place up and the Indians move on to the next round. For Tim McCarver and Bob Brenly, I'm Joe Buck. Thanks for joining us tonight. We'll see you on Wednesday night from Baltimore, game one of the 1997 ALCS. Keep it going, Cleveland. They are partying in Ohio tonight. The Indians knock off the world champs. They take on the Orioles starting Wednesday night. For all of us with Fox Sports, good night. This has been a presentation of Fox Sports, home of the NFL, NHL, and Major League Baseball.